Father, uh, a nation, a church, a family, an individual person without the glory of God is lost, is hopeless, is helpless. We would see Jesus. It's the same cry that, 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 that the early disciples cried out to, to Jesus. We would see Jesus. We, we would have you show us your glory in this house here this morning. We would know you like we've never known you before. We would have more of you than we've ever had before. We confess to you, God, our lack of satisfaction with the mediocre and the mundane, the lukewarm. We, we are tired of the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the attempts at righteousness and the subsequent failures and falling on our face. We want your glory, Jesus. We want you to come in power and might and majesty, Jesus. And we want you to fill this house. We're not ashamed to cry out on the behalf of our own church. This is our people. This is our faith family. And we are saying right now in the name of Jesus, come to this church with glory. Come to our families with your majesty. Come into our hearts, God, with a supernatural power that we've never, ever, ever had before. This is your day, God. This is your hour. Now move mightily on your church in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 3, if you would. Acts chapter 3 and verse 11. Um, in the context here, what's happening just before we read verse 11 is Peter and John have, have, have seen this amazing spiritual awakening. Pentecost has come. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches the word of God faithfully. 3,000 people are saved. Uh, many of those are from outside of Jerusalem, so they go back to their own homes, towns, villages, and cities, and the word of God begins to spread rapidly. Uh, after they uh, leave the upper room, they begin to, in some senses, go back to their regular life, but they're seeing more happening now than they've ever seen before. And so Peter and John are walking to the temple, and there's a man there who's been uh, been, been sick and, and unable to walk for years and years and years. And Peter hears his cry, uh, give me something, give me some alms, give money to me. And I love Peter's response. And this is good news where he says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. Be healed in the name of Jesus. And the man's instantaneously healed. Church, that's the glory of God, isn't it? That's the presence of God. That's his majesty at work. That's his splendor. Uh, working through these earthen vessels, as the Bible calls it, to see his glory manifest on the face of the earth. And they were filled with wonder and awe, and they began to gather together. And that's where we come to verse 11. And while, this, is, this says here in verse 11, while he, speaking of the man who was just healed, clung to Peter and John and all the people, utterly astounded, and they ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. You see some very simple things here. Five very simple things I want to highlight before we go to our next scripture. And number one is this, is this man that was healed clung to the work that God began in his life. The word there, clung, I love that word, is he's clinging to it. I can almost picture this as, as Peter is, and John are walking into the, to the temple, and into Solomon's portico, and here's this guy who's just been healed, and he's just, he's holding on. Maybe he's holding on to his leg, and Peter's just kind of dragging him along like, hey, dude, you can walk, get up, you know? It's, and just this sense of, I will not let this go. Something has gripped my heart. Something has stirred my soul. God's presence is real. I've been sitting by this gate. People have been giving me alms for years, but I've never, ever, ever seen anything like this. And he clings to it. I'm not letting it go. Folks, I want us at the Springs Church and every single individual here listening to my voice this morning to have within them this heart cry, show me your glory. I cling to your glorious work, God. I'm holding on. I want more of you, Jesus. I'm not satisfied with small portions. I want the fullness of your glory and I will hold on to you. I will cling to the word. I will cling to my prayer closet. I will fall on my face before you. I'll seek you day and night. I'm coming after you. I'm charging after you, God. I want all of you. And when, and, and, and in that sense of clinging to God, God loves to be clung to. He loves for you to pursue him. He loves for you to chase after him. He loves for the heart that seeks him. Seek him while he may be found. Is his heart cry for us. 
So number one, we see here just this clinging. I'm not gonna let this go. This is too good. This is too good to let it pass me by. There are times where God works a mighty work in his people. There are times he's going to, times he's gonna do something supernatural in your life, in your heart, in your mind, in your family. A, a word of deliverance, a word of calling, wooing you to something more than you've ever had before. And that's what this word cling is talking about, cling, clinging to the hope, clinging to the promises that God has for you. Second word here is, says that he was clinging and next it says to Peter and John and all the people. When God and his majesty moves in his might, when a people ask God, show us your glory. And God comes and he visits his people with the fullness of his power. When we see those things happen, you're not going to see some small result. You're not going to see a trifling of a response to that majesty of God. When God moves in power, people are going to come and respond to that work of God. When, when there's a manifest presence of God, you can't help but fill every chair. You, you, you can't buy enough chairs from church chair manufacturing company to fill the amount of people that are hungering in our nation for a word from God, for the presence of God, for the power of God. We could not buy enough Phil Long Ford centers to fill, to, to, to allow the room for all the people that would come because they are hungry for Jesus. They are empty and hurting. They are sheep without a shepherd. They are lost and dying and they know that there's something missing that only Jesus can fill. And when the glory of God comes, Comes, when his presence fills, not just this worship service, but fills your heart and your family and your life and your prayer closet becomes electrified with the glory and the presence of God, you will see people will come. Oh, I've said this to you probably a hundred times before and you might get bored with it, but I'm gonna keep saying it. It's John Wesley, my favorite quote. He said, don't worry about drawing crowds. Just get on fire for God and people will come to watch you burn. Isn't that good news? Just get on fire for God. Church, let us get on fire for God. And people, all the people, I love this. It didn't say, and a few people showed up to see what was happening. It doesn't say there's a, a few curious bystanders that stood around the outskirts of Solomon's portico just to hear, you know, what this thing was happening. It said all the people, there was this massive movement when God's glory is manifest to a people that are crying out, saying, God, I'm hungry for more of you. He responds in such a way that people just, just clamor to come into his presence, that they, they are moving in mass. There is a Jesus movement. Can you say amen to that church? a Jesus movement, a real old school, old fashioned, no holes barred, Jesus showing up to his church and making things different. It is totally new. It is totally alive. It is totally something that only God can do. And so we see this great impact on man. It's not an isolated, it's no small thing. It is touching multitudes and multitudes of people. Number three here, it says, they were utterly astounded. Wow. That, that sounds like a good church service to me. How many of you today, or how many of you in past weeks or past months, and, and, and I'm not saying this to say I don't thank God for all he's done here at the Springs Church, but I'm just honestly saying I want a whole lot more. I want a whole lot more. I think we're just barely putting our toe in the water, and I want a whole lot more because I don't think a whole lot of people are driving home and husbands and wives discussing to one another in their cars or around the, the dinner tables and saying, how'd you like church today? And the other person respond, I was utterly astounded. I was utterly astounded. You could have said amen, you say that if you wanted to, but you missed your chance now. So, But, but wouldn't that be glorious if we could, we could barely talk as we're leaving the building here? Just dumbfounded at the, at the presence of God, just, just awestruck at his glory and his majesty. Does, does God still move like that, church? Does God still come in that kind of splendor and glory? I believe so. And they're utterly astounded. They say, they're saying, nothing, nothing I know is like this. Nothing compares to this. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry to go home and watch football. I'm not in a hurry to go home and have roast beef. I, I want more of Jesus. I want to be utterly astounded. I want my life to be more than the trivial things that I find myself having to, to, to bear up under throughout the week. I, I, want, I want his glory manifest. And not just on Sunday, but how about it? Sunday just sort of introduces it to you. 
And then Monday morning, you wake up and say, God, now I want this glory to be manifest in my workplace, in my schools, in my family, in my neighborhood. What would happen if a thousand people that attend Springs Church got so on fire for God, people would come to watch you burn? What would happen if you got so filled with the glory and the majesty and the splendor and the wonder and the power of God that your family would be different, that your children would be different? What would happen if this glory came in such a, a, an astounding way that, that teenagers that are far from God, and you've been praying them for years, you just, you just say, God, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to believe you for my kids. And what if they were just come running back in the house and said, I don't know what happened, but Jesus just got all over me and I want to get saved, I want to get set free. Wouldn't that be glorious? How about some of you wives that have uh, what I call a surly, deadbeat, ne'er-do-well husband, all right? And, and you just, and you need the glory of God to fall on that man. And what would happen if you just truly believe God? I believe you are, an, you are an astounding God, an utterly astounding God, and astound us with this man's salvation, with his redemption, with him being drawn back to the fullness of God. Husbands, the same thing for wives that are, that are drifting, that are wandering, that are lukewarm, that are half-hearted. Oh, what if the glory of God so gripped our families that there would be an astounding, utterly astounding move of God? You can probably tell I'm a little bit excited here this morning. All right, the response to an utterly astounding gospel and an utterly astounding God that all the people are clinging to him, the response is that as people begin to run to God, and that's the next word it says, they were utterly standing and they ran. I like that. They ran. Now, some of you ran this morning is because you were 10 minutes late to church. That's different, okay? That's a little bit different. I love you still. I love you a lot. We get here early and pray, uh, and get ready for worship. But, but uh, this run is a little bit different than that. It's not running because they're late. It's running because they just, they heard God is truly in this place. The, 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 the manifest presence of God has been so thick, so real, his glory, so true, so pure, so whole in that place. I love this word. They were running. It was not a laissez-faire attitude towards the things of the gospel. It was, a, it was a sense of anticipation, a sense of, of, of the soul being consumed with, a, with, a, with a, the prompting of the spirit, an expectation that, that miracles were going to take place, miracles of the mind and the heart and the soul and the body and the family and the workplace and the city and the church. There was an anticipation. Who wouldn't run to church like that? Who wouldn't run to your family in your neighborhoods when, when they're in trouble, when they're hurting? Why, why wouldn't you be the first one that they call? Because the glory of God will cause people to run to him, to, to want to know him, to hunger for him. That's what I believe a true Jesus movement is. It's not the plans of man. It's not his schemes. It's not man's clever ingenuity. It's not man organizing a, an event. It's not man organizing a church-sponsored situation. It's not having songs and sermons. It is, it is when God shows up. When he shows up in ways that, that utterly astound us, you know, people are going to just run. They're going to run to not only this place, but to wherever, wherever God is faithfully being preached, wherever holy lives are, are devout and saying, God, we want to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. Wherever God is moving in his glory in a place like that, people are going to run to be a part of it. And lastly, in these first five things that we see in Acts chapter three, it says they ran, and I like this next word, together. They didn't just run like chickens with their heads cut off, uh, each to their own interest. They ran, what's the word there? Together together. I want us to run together, church. Amen. I don't want us to run opposed to one another. I don't want us to run offended with one another. I don't want us to run in a way that you do your thing and I'll do my thing. I want us to run together. I want us to be truly a family of God. I say I want, but I'm just re really repeating what the Holy Spirit says, where there's glory, where there's manifest power of God. The only way that will come is when a people are in unity Book of Acts, they were together in one accord. They were together as, as one body, as one man, as one, as one heart. And when they were, and they put their differences aside and they put their offenses aside and they were even willing to lay down their, alt, uh, their gift at the altar and go to the one who is offended or being offended and, and begin to, to, to ask God for unity. That's what Paul did in Corinth. He asked him not to be divided about Paul and Apollos. He said, come together as, as one body. Many churches, many families, many of our individual lives are greatly diminished in the glory and power and majesty of God's presence because we're holding on to things in our heart. We're just clinging to things, past hurts, past wounds, things that people have said. A young man called me this week, uh, two weeks ago and he was, he was in his room and in the hallway there were some other 
young people and they began, didn't know he was in that room and they began to talk about him. And it was just in very, very, very bad way how much they didn't like him. And I won't even go into it. But you imagine how, how it crushed that young man's heart just to hear, hear him be, being belittled. And these are other Christians who he's in the body of Christ with. These things should not be so, church. We, we, we should ask God, come. God, if we're going to ask for your glory, you, your glory doesn't come into a vessel that clings to, 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 to a mindset, to a heart, to, to a tongue that, that, that speaks evil, that, that doesn't love truly, that isn't willing to put down grievances and have a heart saying, God, make us one. Make us one. I believe this is a precursor to the glory of God coming is when a church says, God, we truly want to be one. We truly want to love the people around us. We want to love those that seem to us. Maybe their personality is, is the furthest personality from the kind I like at this church, but yet we're going to love them, God. Amen, church. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So they came together. There was unity there. I believe it was because there was unity there that those other four things could happen. The healings that would cause a man to cling. The all the people coming. Do you think God's going to send all the people to a place he knows that's just going to cause them to be bitter and angry and corrupt and, and divided? No, not at all. So I believe that being together is the thing that could cause God to move in an utterly astounding way to cause God to move in a way that people run to come into this house. Do you have some people you'd like to see run into this house? Do you have some people that you work with that you'd like to see run into this house? or your house, or your relationship with you as you minister one-on-one, then let God knit our hearts together, and we'll see his power and his glory. All right, so, so there's another passage here in, in Acts chapter t- uh, 3 before we turn to Corinthians that I, that I just want to touch on because there's a text here that gives, I believe, the, 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 that answers the question of how do these things happen? Why do some churches, some families, some individuals have this kind of attraction, uh, the glory, the majesty, the, the appeal of God. Why do some people in churches have that and some don't? I believe the answer is in verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glo- listen to this, glorified his servant Jesus. That is the answer to the question is, where is your glory, God? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? It is now found in his servant Christ Jesus. God put all of his, all of his uh, uh, glory, all of his majesty, his, his, his plan of action, his, his plan of redemption, his plan of showing his power on earth comes through this one source and this one source only. It does not come through men and their clever uh, uh, articulated speech. It doesn't come through the plans of man, the schemes of man. It doesn't come through hype. It doesn't come through manipulation. It comes through this one thing and this one thing alone, God's servant, Christ Jesus. Through Jesus and Jesus alone, that is the hope for the church. If you want glory in your life, it's not going to come through any other source. It's not going to come through you trying to work harder. It's not going to come through you trying to do more. It's not going to come through you, uh, in a sense, just saying, I, I want to ascend to a great place for myself. Matter of fact, the opposite is true. It is when you empty yourself. It is when you say, I want no reputation of myself. It is when you agree with John the Baptist, I must decrease so that he must increase. It is the empty vessel he fills with his glory. Not the man of pride, of agenda, not the woman with their own... Uh, 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 thinking of how their life should be unfolding before them. It's those who lay down their own agenda, lay down the idolatry of saying, this is what I want to make me happy. And those are the people that just get empty. And when they get empty, God says, ah, there's a vessel I can move in. There's an earthen vessel that I can put my treasures deep, deep within. How many of you here today say, would you wave your hand and say, I want that. I want, I want to be filled. I want to be filled with that, that, the treasures of God from heaven. It won't come through any other source except through Jesus Christ himself. When we glorify Jesus, when his name is lifted up on high, we will find that, that other, uh, uh, other dreams and aspirations we once held dear will just fall as if nothing at our feet. And then the glory of God will rise through the power of his demonstrating himself to be strong in our life. So how do we get this glory? How do we get this to this place where God is glorifying his servant Jesus in our midst. How do we come to that? Because this is a question that's been asked before. I already quoted a few of these passages. I kind of got ahead of myself here, but, but they asked in the Old Testament, where is the Lord God of Elijah? 
Many ask, how long, O oh Lord, how long before, that, before you come, God, and show your power, show your, show your glory? Moses, here's our, uh, one of our other texts for the day, Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. Exodus 33, 18 is one of these questions, and, it, and it's, it's here, I believe it's in uh, the ESV, but let me just touch on it from the, the King James Version, because he uses the word here, and he, speaking of Moses, said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. We don't use that word very often, beseech. I beseech thee, but man, what a powerful word. Moses is crying out to God here, I beseech thee. It's a, do you hear the cry in that kind of word? It's not just, hey, God, if, if you've got a little bit of time, could you show me a little bit of your glory? Or I, I've had a touch of your glory before. That's been nice. Can you give me a little bit more? No, he's saying, I beseech thee. Lord, it's, it's the groaning of my soul. It's an intensity that, that is burning within me to see your majesty and your glory in this place, I beseech thee. And he says, show me thy glory. Later on in the same chapter, it says that in response to Moses asking, as I'm sure many of you in this room have done, asking God, show me your glory. God responds in the affirmative and says, I'm going to pass by you. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. And when I pass by you, you're not going to be able to see my face. No man can see my face and live. But I'm going to pass by and you're going to see my back. And when you see my back, you're going to be filled with the glory of God, just being near to God. And now, as God says in, in Acts chapter 3, through his servant Christ Jesus, as, as we have this manifestation, this presence of Jesus in our life, and we have a vision of Jesus, a revelation of Jesus, we see his glory. So Moses sees his glory. He sees his back, and, and he's filled with such glory. Uh, chapter 34, verse 33 and 34 says this, and when Moses finished speaking, he put a veil over his face. How many of you ever read the story before? Let me see your hand if you've read this story before. Moses put a veil over his face. I've read the story probably a hundred times, probably learned it in, in the flannel graph Sunday school thing with Moses was up there and the teacher put a veil over his face. And there was the sense of Moses was so filled with the glory of God that the people couldn't bear to look at his face. Have you ever thought about that before? It was just, he was so... It was, just, it was just too much for them to bear. They, they couldn't bear with what the, the Hebrew word there's Shekinah, the light, the brilliance of the Lord. But look at this. It's, it's not necessarily what's being said here. As, as the next few verses go on to say, um, um, Exodus 34, 33 says, but when Moses finished speaking, he put a veil over his face. I had always thought it was, he came down from the mountain, was, was just too shiny, making people's eyes hurt. They were putting on some sunglasses and, and it was just too much so they, he covered himself. But it says here, he came down from the mountain and he spoke to the people. And when he was finished speaking to the people, then he put a veil over his face. Why did he do that? Why did he put the veil on after he was speaking to the, to the people? All right, let's move ahead. The answer is found in 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you with me so far, church? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 13. Now bear with me. We're going to answer that question. Why the veil? Uh, for what is being brought to an end? Okay, that gives you a hint right there. Something is being brought to an end. Moses sees glory on his face. At first, he didn't know it was there, but then he sees this glory. He begins to speak to the people. The hint here is something's being brought to an end. And because it's being brought to an end, Moses covers his face. Uh, for what is being brought to an end, came, it came with glory. So, so it entered into Moses and it touched his face by glory, but it came with glory, but much more will what is permanent have glory. What's it saying here about the, the veil over Moses' face, the shine on his face? It was not permanent. It was not a lasting glory. It was a glory that faded. It, it came for a while, but then it became dulled. It was hot and on fire, then it became moderate or lukewarm. It was up and down and in and out. Verse 12, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Oh, I like that. We are very bold. And the next verse says, not like Moses. Now, that seems kind of rude to Moses, doesn't it? Paul the apostle here is saying, we're very, we have hope. We're very bold, not like Moses. Well, why wasn't Moses bold? In some ways, he was quite bold, but in this, in this area of the glory of God, there was a missing element of boldness. And what was that missing element of, of boldness? Uh, but their minds, uh, verse 14, but their minds were hardened to this day. When they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, but only through Christ is the veil 
uh, taken away. Verse 17, now the, spirit of the, uh, now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we with all unveiled face behold the glory uh, of God and being transformed in the same image from one degree to another. For this comes from the Lord. We have a hope. And it says in verse 13, not like Moses who put a veil over his face. Listen to this. And here's the point I'm trying to make. Not like Moses who had put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. So what, you see what's happening here, church? Are you, are you following this? Moses was, was coming down off the mountain. He was full of the glory of God. The majesty was showing through his physical face, but it was fading And while the glory was there, he was speaking to the people and the people were mesmerized. The glory of God is here. Say to us what you will. We will obey you because the glory of God is here. But he knew that glory was fading. So he would cover his face until he went up to the mountain again and got and got refueled, re-glorified, if you will, got more glory, came down, spoke to them again. His glory would start fading and then he'd put the veil over his face so that they wouldn't know that his glory was coming to an end. That, that his glory was fading. Now, it says in the same text, we now have a hope and we're bold, not like Moses who knew it was gonna fade away. We have, and I love the word there, it says, we have a permanent hope. We have a permanent glory. We have an unchanging glory. We have an unfading glory. We have a glory that says here in, in a, at the end of verse 18, and being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Church, God, amen, you can put your hands together for that. It's good news. We have a God who's not saying, come to me, come on Sundays, get filled with glory, and on Monday it'll start diminishing, Tuesday gets weaker, by Wednesday, hump day, you know, you know it's just, you're gonna barely make it. Come, sque- you know, come squeaking in here just barely on next Sunday to get refilled. Again, no, that's not what God's saying. What he's saying is here, his glory, his manifest presence, his power, his majesty is gonna come upon you. And when it comes upon you, he's not gonna take it away and say, you better get back here for, you know, or, or it's gonna be gone. No, what he says is come back on Monday morning and Tuesday and come back on lunch break on Wednesday and get into my presence and get more in me, more and more of me because it's not fading away but it is growing, it is increasing, it is moving from one glory to another. Folks, this is not for a small part of the body of Christ. This is not for super saints who can move in the miraculous realms. This is a word, a promise, a truth for every single Christian from the weakest to the strongest, from the youngest to the oldest. The promise of God is, is here, it's yes and amen, saying he wants to fill you with his glory more than you want to be filled with his glory. He wants to fill you with his glory that he says here. What does his glory do? It brings freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from bondage of sin. Freedom from self-despair and defeat. Freedom from lukewarmness and mediocrity in our Christian faith. Freedom from, from being radical one month and then all of a sudden being diminished greatly and, and kind of wandering and drifting from God the next month. We have a freedom to stay in the glory of God. Can you say amen to that church? And not only that, it says here, secondly, there's not only a freedom, but there is a, uh, it says in here, and, and those who behold the glory of the Lord with an unveil, the veil's not even there anymore. Don't worry about putting a veil over it because it's not going to diminish. God is going to increase it. And he's saying here that not only will it bring freedom, but it says those who are beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image, being transformed into the image of who? Jesus Christ, who God has chosen to be his servant to manifest his glory, the kind of glory that makes people run to God, that makes people see the utterly astounding power of God manifest in our lives. It is that God, who's moving through his son, Christ Jesus, putting that same glory that was in Peter and John in in every single one of us in this room here today. There is not an exclusion cause. There is not a, a for you, but not for you. It is for every single one of you. And I am so excited about this. And I am so filled with joy and hope. And, 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 it, and it's a boldness in me that's not like ever was in Moses because he was never sure. After he preached his one of his last sermons and he, and he shared the law again and the covenant again, he said, you know what he said? But I know you're not gonna keep this. Oh, but I have a, a better hope here this morning. 
I have a, a new covenant here this morning that says God is not only going to help you keep that, but he's going to cause you to increase in the covenant that he has with you. You're going to, to see more of his glory, not less. You're going to see more of his power, not a diminishment of his power. You're going to see more freedom and victory over the powers of darkness and sin and despair and helplessness and hopelessness than you've ever seen before. You're going to see more of a transformation in your life, transforming you from glory to glory to glory. He's going to be moving on you in such a powerful way. I want to suggest to you in closing church that we put away the veils and allow the manifest glory of Jesus Christ to be seen in our life. Put away anything that would diminish that, that fullness of the glory. Put away sin. Put away slander. Put away the anger and wrath and malice and unforgiveness. Put away anything that could, could diminish that glory of God because he wants you to shine brightly. He wants you to be filled with his power. He wants your life to be different than it is now. He's saying to you, I believe with all my heart, you don't have to be lukewarm. You don't have to be burdened by the habitual patterns of sin that seem to rob us of our joy and our power. You don't have to go weeks and months without seeing that change of transformation that he promises through what we read there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You can see the power of God. When one turns to the Lord, the Bible says the veil is removed. Isn't that good news? The veil of fear, this is going to diminish. The veil of fear that this is not going to work. The veil of fear that says, God, your power is not going to work through me. I'm too weak. I'm too... No, it's in, it's in our weakness. He's strong. It's in these earthen vessels that he manifests his glory. It, it, he shines through, through people that are broken hearted and their lives are, 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 are in turmoil. But he comes and he begins to transform those people. And he begins to show his glory. He begins to show his glory. Folks, I think you're with me, aren't you? I mean, I, I, think, I think you have the same thing, the same thing churning in your soul, don't you? This thing that, is, that, that I've done my best, but I really haven't done it well because it's indescribable, really. When we talk about something being utterly astounding, it's, it's indescribable. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back, but I just want to try to, try to, to close this by just saying to you that, that, that what I'm talking about is transcendent. It's, it is not describable. Man, you remember when, when Paul went to the third, I think he said to the third heavens? And he said, and God show me things that, 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 that are not, he uses a strange word. It's not legal for me to describe to you. It's not, he uses the word lawful in one of the translations. Isn't that weird? It's like he saw these brilliant things of the glory and majesty of God. And God says, um, Paul, I'm, I'm glad I could show that to you, but it's, it, did you know it's against the law? Here's the rule book it says here. You can't describe this to people. It's, it's against the law. That's kind of a weird statement, isn't it? But, but I don't think he meant in a sense it's illegal to show it, but he's saying it's, the, the law of our inability. Uh, just there, there's something, do you, ever, do you know what I'm talking about, church? There's something you want that you can't even, you can't even utter to God. There's something, there's a hunger in your soul that, that really can't even be described. There's something that I am calling out for this church to experience that mere mortal words don't have the ability to fully describe. It is, it is beyond us. It is, it is it's the glory of God. Who, who can describe it? Who can know it? Who can know his ways? Who, who, can, who can tap into to, to being able to articulate what it's like? But you know it when you get it, right? I mean, you know, you know when you're beginning to, to say, yeah, that's it, the unveiled face, the glory of God, the majesty of God, the splendor. That, that glory says to us, you don't need to lead a, a weak and defeated life. That glory of God says to us, you you don't need to go without a testimony to your neighborhood and to your job. The glory of God says this church and churches that, that, that just experience a hunger for this glory and the manifest presence of that glory, a church like that is going to see the glory of God manifest, right? We're going to see things that are undescribable, things that, 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 that are utterly astound us. Lost people will come into this room here that we're sitting in. Lost people come into your house, church. Lost people will, will, will sit down with you at lunch hour on your job and you're going to describe something and you're going to speak something, but it's going to be more than your words. It's going to be the glory of God in you. And, and, and they're going to say, truly, God is in this place. Wouldn't that be sweet? That's, that's the life you and I hunger for. That's what you want more now. If you would stand with me, please. Everyone from the back to the sides here. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, is there anyone in this place here today that you'd say, Pastor Gary, I, I'm, uh, I'm listening to this message about 
I could have more glory, but to, to be honest with you, I don't think I have any glory yet because I'm not really walking in a relationship with God. I, I, I am living for myself.